welcome to another episode of the Pause It Podcast. I am Dr. Sam. With me, as always, is Dr. Robert. Yay. How are you doing, Dr. Robert? Hey, Sam. How are you? Oh, recovering from some travel we've been doing. We were actually together, and we were going to do a podcast while we were together, and then we were too busy, <laughs> so we never did it. Yep. It was a really busy conference. Uh, we were out in Denver and doing the International Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Conference, which is my favorite conference of the year because I like ER. Um, but it actually, it was a really good conference for the My Balto Foundation, too. So it was such an awesome, it was really, really a good chance. I feel like we really got the word out there um, about what we're trying to do, which is, I mean, I guess maybe we really should say what the My Balto Foundation is. It might, it's been a little while since we've talked about yeah. it. That's a really good point. Um, so the My Balto Foundation, what we do essentially is we put a charity into every veterinary hospital across the country. Uh, we do something a little more unique uh, where we kind of create a roundup charge at checkout. So similar to how you maybe go to McDonald's or PetSmart, you round up at checkout. Now your vet can do it too. And the nice thing is, you know, you're helping your local community when you actually round up because it all goes towards their hospital. Um, and then we do some other things in the back end to help make those funds more accessible to those hospitals. Uh, so they get instant approval because they know how much money is in their account. Uh, and that's really what makes us unique. We're trying to really honestly change the industry and how they access those funds because not every owner fits into that cookie cutter approach of who needs financial assistance. Right. Um, sometimes you, vets just, and honestly, I mean this honestly, there's a lot of patients vets really want to help, but there are no options for them. And right. that's what I think the My Balto Foundation is best at. We are kind of Trying to fit that donut hole of where where some of those some of those guys just fall through the cracks. And mm -hmm. um, so we basically have tried to do all the work on the back end to make it mm -hmm. so simple because uh, we as veterinarians understand that, like, there's just no time at yeah. work, you know, to, to do it. And sometimes really, especially this is something I feel like was really resonating at the conference, like, because these are the people that are like dealing with the emergencies, life or death at that moment, every day, every night. And especially at 3 a.m. when you can't contact any financial institutions. So yep. that's that's our goal. It's, it's it's like we've said before, it's a lofty goal, but but we really believe in it. And so this was this was a lot of fun. I felt like really energized to be able to talk about what we're doing. And um, it was just I, I really I had a great time. So I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a blast. I think we like, come into a lot of people join the foundation this week. So I'm very excited to. See how it all turns out. So if you have a veterinary practice that you want to get my Balto Foundation there, talk to your docs. Yep. Uh, see, next time you go to your equipment. Heard of it. If not, send them our way. And also too, when you do end up at a clinic that has it, uh, make sure you round up and give back to the community around you. Um, just because that's what it takes. Everybody just giving a little bit and it's a lot less painful that way. And then one day you never know, you might be in the position where you need it and be thankful that somebody did it for you. So um, just a little, little plug to kind of pay it forward. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. Actually, it's funny because we spend so much time talking to veterinarians about it that I don't yeah. realize we don't talk to people about it. So that's a really good point. Round yeah. up. It's yeah, great. round up. Um, And so today, I guess this is a little bit brought to you by where we just were. We're going to talk about first aid and CPR. Um, mm -hmm. This is like really Robert's. This is Robert's show here because I think I can count on like one hand the amount of times I've done CPR. It's not very often. Um. You know, I've done it. Um, and over the years, uh, with variable outcomes, I mean, I think that that's an important thing that we'll kind of talk about. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we'll give you some first aid tips, some things that we've seen just go really well. And some things we've seen go really poorly. And yep. when, when your pet really needs, uh, like first aid and when you should intervene and when you should just get them to the clinic. <laughs> so yes. that's, that's what we're going to cover today. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great because I think there's a lot of things you can do at home to make things less worse um, than they could be. And I think it's a great opportunity to kind of learn a couple of things tonight and hopefully save your pet when you can. So I'm excited. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I guess, I guess the first thing I'd ask you, Robert is like, okay, so explain a situation or the most common situation where you're doing CPR. Why are you doing it? Well, for most owners, uh, actually most patients, cats and dogs, they go into arrest or their heart will stop uh, due to, respiratory causes so they stop breathing first um that's all their heart will stop afterwards but they always almost always stop breathing first um so we usually get some inclination of when that's happening because we'll see them stop breathing we know we have very few seconds to get started on things because the most important thing is to start chest compressions right away mm -hmm. um but honestly i'm trying to think of the situations it's like it can happen from so many situations honestly from heart failure to being hit by a car and they have uh 
bleeding internally. Um, there's so many situations that this can happen, and it's just uh, it's it's hard because the owners don't know what's going on. They see their pets really lethargic, and half the time they're running in, their pets already passed away, and that time is actually crucial because you really need to start CPR right away if you're going to. So if so if somebody let's say at home, okay, I mean this is probably what people are wanting to know. So what happens if you see? your pet start to turn blue, which I, I think would probably be one of the first indications that there's a problem. You know, you, you see them struggling to breathe, pawing at their mouth, maybe they're coughing or they're gagging or, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's different things that you can see. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you see that their, their like actual color is changing or they're, they're turning blue. Um, what should they do? Honestly, get in the car as quickly as possible. Um, and get your vet. Don't try and if you see your pet where they've actually stopped breathing, if you have two people with you, first get in the car. Yeah. Two, have the other person in the back seat just doing chest compressions. Don't worry about breathing. Um, you're not going to be good enough at it. No offense as a pet owner because there's even professionals that aren't. Um, but compressions are the most important thing. Um, Can you, you say why? People, just just remind yeah, no, why. So, um, so our goal is to restore circulation as much as possible to get blood flow moving to the body. And even at your best. So normal, if you're hundred percent when you're normal and breathing and alive at our best, when you, uh, patients are rested, 30% is where we reach our peak. So you're doing a third of a, if we're doing everything hundred percent, right. 30% is the best quality we're going to get. So mm -hmm. you want to do as much of compressions to focus on as you can. A lot of times, if you're not doing the breathing, right, you can blow air into their stomach. Uh, if you're not careful. So it's really important just to really focus on the chest compressions and do that as long as you can. Do not feel bad if you're tired. Uh, there's a reason we do two minute cycles of chest compressions. Just do them as long and often as you can to try and keep your pet alive until they get to the hospital. Because, mm -hmm. and, and um, the, the unfortunate part about all of this is that when your pet does go into cardiac arrest, the chance of them coming back from CPR is less than 5%. Yep. Um, that's true. Unfortunately, it, that's true of people too. I mean, that this is like a, this is a fact yeah. of CPR and, and just to put it out there, that's actually what they recommend for people too, is not that you take, you're not supposed to anymore. It used to be the thought of like, give them breaths, then do the mm -hmm. chest compressions, give them a breath. That is not, is just keep the chest compressions going until somebody comes or you get them to a hospital. That's true of people too. Yeah. And I think that's the one that I think you hit right on the head because that's the biggest misnomer, I think with like all the TV shows that we watch. Well, there was, what was the one back in our day? Like ER or, uh, was it that, it was like a- Grey's Anatomy. Like a, even before then, like the, the older Baywatch. ones. Like, <laughs> Jesus, Baywatch. <laughs> there's one, there's, I guess I am older than you. <laughs> uh, there was one, that, they're like a medical, uh, like my, my parents were killing me for not knowing that. I think it was something like ER related, but- um, Not they, the show like ER. Every, I mean, there was the show ER with like George Clooney and like that. That was it, crew. yeah. Okay, that, that was, was the ER. That was one. Yeah, yeah, that was ER. Um. But yeah, they like got every patient back. And oh I my think gosh. Well, that's like Grey's Anatomy too. I mean, and not only <laughs> that, in Grey's Anatomy, if you notice, every time they're in surgery, they're patient codes. I'm like, well, then you are terrible at your job. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, that doesn't Who happen. Who is your anesthesiologist? <laughs> and what are they doing? <laughs> it's it's terribly frustrating because you see them like come back almost every time. You're like, that's not how it works. Like it's literally less than 5%. And if you're lucky, anesthetic so related to either the drugs that we're giving or the inhalant anesthesia that they're breathing, maybe 30% of the time you can get them back. Um, and that's the, when I say get them back, means get them back long enough to literally walk out of the hospital later on. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You can get a heartbeat back that, that you can yeah. do, but um, yeah, no, I have the only time I've ever been successful with CPR was in a case of just an adverse reaction to anesthesia. We had a cat that arrested, but by tech was i mean right there and i was right there and we got them back very quickly and mm -hmm. i mean it was like seconds and that's how he walked out of the hospital but and those are the best situations honestly um when they just arrest in front of you and you can yeah. move forward treatment plans like move forward with, uh, cpr right away right uh, it's, it's a team process you need a couple people to do it well mm -hmm. um but if it does happen at home I tailor to the ER and hopefully have, if you have three people, even better having two people just switching compressions uh, and just focusing on the you know, larger animal, focus on the top of the chest, like the peak of it as high as it is and just pushing down into the rhythm of, well, a good, what's a good song that you listen to for uh, CPR? We have, we have songs to keep the rhythm. And what's Staying, the song alive. You Staying alive. Staying ah, ah, ah. <laughs> alive. And you think we're kidding, that's but what I, That's what I always learned. 
no it's a it's a great one um and literally that's one. when i have done cvr like at work i have had to like take a deep breath and do it because otherwise i i will get i'll get upset you know what i mean because i don't want it to go poorly so oh, yeah. i've had to Excellent. fix myself absolutely that's uh and it's like that's kind of fun a little bit but um baby not shark also doing cpr <laughs> yeah actually no not when you're doing cpr no, uh, no. But baby shark is another one that's for you which one young. baby shark oh really oh good that's probably a good one because shark. most kids probably like younger than us don't actually know staying alive <laughs> Like, exactly if i were oh, to no. tell my text right now like staying alive half of them would be like what is that <laughs> and so oh, God. Like, baby shark thank you for giving me another option because i all know baby shark what's another one uh, i think the star wars bump bum, 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 that like that one is apparently or so one of the star wars songs that's actually okay. also part sorry it's we just did a CPR uh, course at our hospital, actually, because of, like, refresh our guidelines. Yeah. And they played, like, six songs that I was like, oh, I didn't realize half of these were CPR songs. But the rhythm well, that's is good, because there. we can't all go with, with staying alive, even though that's, like, a perfect one for what the situation yeah. is. But, um, yeah. well, I guess the other thing, too, okay, so that's a really good tip. So you want to do it where you want to direct your compressions in a large dog. But what about a cat or a small dog? Yeah, so just because they're smaller, you're going to focus more over the actual heart itself. And it kind of makes sense a little bit intuitively when you're not panicked and actually doing CPR. But, you know, bigger dogs, you're going to have a really hard time compressing the actual heart circulation. So you're going to focus on maybe just changing the pressure within the cavity. Whereas dog, smaller dogs and cats, they're small enough. You can actually squeeze the heart if you squeeze hard enough. Yeah, that's uh, true. Like you actually are supposed to surround that part of them and where you should feel it that's where you're doing it and it does get tiring i will say oh yeah your hand will cramp and it's okay um you switch hands then and go to the other side and switch back but it's yeah it's it's definitely uh it's a lot of work you will sweat it's good to have someone to switch out with you because it's a tough thing to do and you're gonna break ribs that's okay and that is actually another thing that i think people don't realize happens in people because of all the tv shows mm -hmm. out there like my sister, um, she's a human doctor, not a human vet. <laughs> she's a human vet. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, when she would talk to people about their, you know, DNRs and stuff like that, like, and, and people would say, yeah, no, do everything. You know, if something happens to my wife, mother said, whatever it is. And she'd say, okay. Or like when you're, someone's having to do it for themselves, you're like, okay, you want me to possibly break every rib in your chest in order like i just need you to understand that that's what we're talking about here because that is what happens and uh people don't really understand that fully and i think maybe we should even take a step back and just say should let's say you get your pet to the hospital on time and they are still breathing literally as they walk in it but then they go into a rest their front the triage nurse is going to ask you if your pet dies in the back do you, do you want to do cpr they're going to ask for a code status and the question is, should you say yes or not? And I think that's a good topic to start with. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have this conversation a lot with your clients. Hopefully not mm -hmm. as much. But no. um, I would say we almost never do, which which maybe isn't a good thing either. You know what I mean? But it's just we don't expect these things to happen. Yeah, and hopefully they shouldn't. Like, hopefully they're healthier right. when they're walking to see you. Um, but almost, I can say almost every patient that comes back into ER is asked whether they're just having a different ear infection or what. It's just protocol, you ask. Um, I even had a patient one time that we were cutting his nails. It was a 16 year old chihuahua and it arrested on me suddenly. Um, I don't know why. Um, right. but we did that was the one time we didn't have one, and then that protocol went into place very quickly afterwards. We did CPR yeah. anyway. Um, but um well our, but, our policy yeah. is sort of like you do CPR and then you contact the owner and you continue until they tell you to stop. Yeah, and that's a great honestly policy to have because that delay in not doing CPR is the difference yeah. between whether or not you're gonna get them back or not. Right. And so the decision whether or not to choose to do CPR or not, honestly, this is not me being a veterinarian, this is more just me being whatever about it, I guess. If your pet's there and they're older and they're there for an illness that you know about, and that's the reason they're passing away, don't do CPR. Mm -hmm. That's just my honesty. If they're there for heart failure and they arrest, they have to be on a ventilator literally afterwards to yeah. get out of heart failure. Right. Um, if they're having that hard time, they were going to go on a ventilator, the, the veterinarian comes in like, they're going to be on a ventilator after this. They will never come off that ventilator, for except for very, very few circumstances. Um, now, if you have a young dog that had some sort of trauma, 
or they ate something, something along those lines, or they're anesthetic related, go for it. Right, right. Every time. Um, but if it's an older dog or cat, they've got a history of illness, and that's why they passed away in the first place. Mm-hmm. I typically encourage owners not to, because I, the five percent is like less than that at that point, and they're yeah, gonna have five the percent encompasses those and the good ones. So you have to think like yeah. when it's those, it's even less. You know what I mean? Like it's absolutely not likely. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it is kind of a sad. It is kind of like a sad thing to think about because like you you don't want to necessarily have this be the truth like i wish this was not the truth um and i don't i think that people really don't realize how stylized like all the like it's not i mean you know that just does not happen no it's it's not as uh it's tough uh because we'll be doing cpr for really 15 20 minutes in the back knowing that patient's not coming back yeah and the owner doesn't want to stop uh we the longest cpr i did was i gotta be careful about not using names um but it was an hour and 30 minutes because oh we gosh. actually kept getting the jack russell terrier that we kept getting back the owner of this dog also owned a country so they were um going to keep doing it until literally they had no choice and eventually at some point we're like it's just, it's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, we did it for an hour and a half and we actually got them back a couple of times during that episode, but eventually we couldn't do it. So, yeah, that's really sad. Um, I think probably the longest I've ever done was like 45 minutes, but that's still a really long time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to say there was more of a, like, we couldn't cut, we were tr- struggling to get in touch with the owner. So we were just continuing until we were told like, it's okay to stop, you know? Mm-hmm. And so Something else that so the general public knows is that there is something called the Recover Guidelines, which is pretty much CPR guidelines for veterinarians. And they're about to update those guidelines pretty significantly here in the next, well, they said a while ago, but like the next six months to a year, hopefully, that's going to change like how we do CPR and how long we should do it for and different protocols to make it better. Mm. So I think that'll be interesting to see how that affects our industry. Maybe we'll improve our outcomes by a little bit. I don't think it's anything drastic. Oh, you'll but, have to tell me, like, as a, you know, general practice doctor, I don't really feel like that's something that would come past me and without me yeah, looking yeah. for it. So when that does come up, let me know. Cause I would. Yeah. Be- it's, it's cool to learn about. And it just, it just shows that we are, we are always trying to get better as well. Like we're trying to like the information that we have and get better those things. Cause we want to give your pets back in the best way possible, but CPR is tough. Um, but there's happier situations before they get to the vet that we can talk about that are, <laughs> you know, that are uh, just as important that maybe you can help give your pet a better chance. And I think you mentioned one before we would start talking the podcast mm-hmm. um, that you want to bring up that say your dog's bleeding or something like that and how they address that. Well, and I think, I think that's the, that's the thing, right? Is that like, you, you need to know, like if, if there's an actual, like if there's internal bleeding that you think is happening, um, so they're getting really pale or something like that, then you just gotta, you have to get them to the vet. I mean, that's, there's, there's nothing else you can do there, but like, if they're bleeding out, like I had one case where, um, two dogs in the same household had gotten into a like fight and the owners came home to just kind of blood everywhere. And this dog was actually like a great Dane. He was huge. And, um, the, the, there was actually like a vessel that was open, just like gushing, gushing. And so the owners, they thought fast, they went, they grabbed a tat, like they grabbed not a, not a big thick towel. Cause you don't want it to be too thick because what can happen is they continue to bleed and you don't know how much they're bleeding if you can't. So you want to be able to make sure that it's nothing too thick you put pressure and you really put pressure down and that's what they did. They they held pressure on it until they got there. And then as soon as they got there, I was able to actually grab it with a hemostat because it was a huge vessel that I was just like, what? And I was like, Oh gosh. And I, and then I tied it off and it was, you know, I mean, it was the beginning of a whole trauma workup, but like, you know, I mean, but at least we could stop the dog from bleeding out and get, you know, the rest of the information. Um, so, so pressure, 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 pressure. Yeah, is what I you think need to put on bleeding. That's probably the best advice, and also be careful. I know it sounds kind of silly, but a lot of times when dogs are in pain like that, even mm-hmm. dogs are normally super sweet dogs. They will bite sometimes because it just hurts. Uh, that's their only way of saying no. I'm in pain, mm-hmm. and I like the number of owners I can tell you that come in ever being bitten by their pet is absurd. 
I've had the same, same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, Gotta be um, really careful. Oh, and that's the other thing too. If your dog is having a seizure, do not try to put anything in their mouth. They're not going to choke on their tongue. That is not a real thing. Just don't touch their face. If anything, move things away from them, you know, so that they don't, or if they're a small dog, you can put them on the ground so they don't fall off a couch or something like that. But, um, but for the most part, just try to stay calm and like start timing it because if it goes more than five minutes, you need to get them in the car and get them to the vet. Um, yeah, that's great advice because seizures aren't fatal. Sing- singular seizures are not fatal. I was going to say, unless, unless they're not coming out of the seizure. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> usually that's singular why, That's why the five minute mark, because if, if they're still in it at five minutes, start driving to the, to the vet, because if they're still in it at 20 minutes, they need meds to help get out of it. And yes. you know, I mean, that's when they start to go that, that there's, We'll talk about yeah. seizures another day, like specifically. Seizures. Have we talked about seizures? I did we? I don't think so. I don't know. We, we should talk about seizures. So many point. podcasts that we we should talk about seizures. We'll, so we'll do that. We'll we'll talk about seizures specifically, um, because that is a big topic and it's a good topic yeah. to talk about. Um, because there's lots of different reasons for seizures. I don't know. I'll look yeah. back and see if we did. <laughs> yeah. But if we did, maybe yeah. we'll update. Who knows? Um, but that's but that's a, another one. Um, one other thing about bleeding. So I've had a lot of owners, there are certain spots on dogs that tend to be a nuisance when they bleed, right? So like a tail, when that's yep. bleeding, it tends to make a big mess. When a paw is bleeding, <laughs> that tends to be pretty messy. Um, ear tips tend to be so very annoying. messy. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, is like, they don't even have to be big bleeds. They just make a mess because dogs shake their head and then the blood goes everywhere they wag their tail blood goes everywhere and it looks like a massacre um and then the paw pads they just tend to bleed a lot and they're stepping and then there's you know obviously so i think one of the biggest mistakes people make is that they feel the need to wrap paws wrap tails i've not had anyone wrap a head so that's uh i've had one mostly <laughs> because they can't they doesn't stay on i've seen yes. veterinarians like do expert jobs of wrapping heads and they last for five seconds yeah. so that's not the way to go but i would say i would say like if your dog is bleeding that badly that like you just it's just not stopping they just probably need to be seen and i would be very cautious wrapping things i have seen entire tails die because people mm. wrapped the tail too tight and cut it off like a tourniquet i mean and i'm literally telling you like to the bone with dead tail and then i had to amputate the tail after i've seen people cause pressure necrosis on hand on like like you know um on paws and on like the the lower part of like a leg um to the point to where it was to tendons so um i have seen uh the ear tips are a little different but you you can put an e-collar on and that will keep it from going all over the house for a little while um and and also just trying to put pressure on it like it will stop bleeding eventually although when they shake their head they open it back up i got a lot it's always just shaking the head you're just like stop shaking yeah Uh, you're like don't shake um but um i actually have seen people take um tube socks very loosely and put them over their dog's ears and that actually as long as it's very very loose and you can put like your whole hand in there you're not gonna like that's fine like you could do that for like a little dog but yeah not not probably a big dog (laughs) no i agree and like i don't mind a wrap if you're literally doing it just to get to the hospital like no no i'm fine with that too what i'm saying is like i've had people wrap it for days yes that is big no no huge no no so i agree 100 and even if it longer than more than a couple hours like uh, like i said it's it's bad but we see you've probably seen a couple cats maybe at this point where like small child will put like a rubber band around their tail or their leg and you can't see the rubber band because it blends in with their fur and then three or four days later their foot swollen and it looks necrotic and it's horrible so yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. um those things can go really really bad and you got to be so careful trying to do things like that i mean i i have i will say on occasion like i will see like somebody that's you know trained and knows how to wrap like a human hand or a human leg um yeah. and they'll do okay usually they don't make it too tight but you just got to be really careful you have to i mean yeah. if you're gonna wrap anything put so much like cushion so yeah. that you don't cause a problem you better off do that but i'd say for the most part what you're saying is right like wrap it long enough to get to the hospital 
You're better off if it's not bleeding copiously, just put an e-collar on them so that they can't lick it and just yep. keep them in their crate so that they can't make a mess in your house. But, you know, you don't want to, you do not want to cut off circulation. 100% agree. Yeah, that's the that most important fair. thing. Yeah, you'll make a small problem a much bigger problem very fast. Oh, another thing that I've seen, um, I've seen a wound become a burn because somebody was putting, well, one, this person was putting alcohol to clean it. Continue oh, mm -hmm. oh, 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 that yeah. sounds horrible. Yeah. So you think about like when you get a wound, you know, sometimes people clean it with alcohol and that's painful and it's a superficial yeah. wound. And that's one thing, one time. Same thing with hydrogen peroxide. If you're going to clean a wound with hydrogen peroxide one time, it's not my preference and it's not my recommendation. In fact, I would tell yeah. you to just lavage it with tap water, warm tap water for like, for like five minutes if you can, like just clean it. You know, dilution is a solution to pollution. Um, <laughs> you can do that. Um, <laughs> the problem is, is that things like alcohol and things like, you know, um, hydrogen peroxide, again, hydrogen peroxide one time on a wound, is that's fine. But, it, you know, yeah. it, the problem is, is it's cytotoxic at some point, it will kill off the good healing. Yeah. And so it will actually take it longer to heal. And in some cases, it can make it worse. So fight your instinct to do that and, and try not to, to do that. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing because even like medical recommendations like that we do in the clinic, we have all the fancy supplies. We grab a shower hose essentially and just spray the wound down. Like oh, yeah. this is not fancy sterile saline or nope. water bags. Like it's literally, literally my favorite thing to do is lavage. Yep. It yep. is like nothing makes a wound happier than making it nice and fresh and clean and get the yep. bad stuff out. Yeah, that's the best thing you could actually do before your pet even gets to the. I mean. You should just bring them to the ER if it's that bad of a wound, but like yeah. try and keep them as clean as possible. It's not always easy, especially depending on the nature of the wound. Like they get hit by a car and they were, you know, road rash. That's hard and stuff like that. But yeah, that's very hard to clean out even for us. And that needs to be yeah. properly debrided. And yeah. I would say there's a few rules of thumb. Your dog gets into a dog fight and gets bit. They need to be seen. They're going to need antibiotics. It's an infected wound. Your dog yeah. gets hit by a car or a golf cart. Don't wait three days. Yes. Like I I've had people do. Don't do that. Yes. Don't, it's that, much don't easier to deal with it <laughs> right off the bat than yeah. three days later. Because you may not know something's wrong with them, and that's the biggest thing with blunt trauma injuries. A lot of times, mm -hmm. the injury will get worse over time. Yes. Like that bleeding in their abdomen will get a lot worse as it's going, or their contusions in their chest, like the bruising on their lungs from being hit by a car will get worse, and they'll have a hard time breathing. So just don't hesitate. Like, it's just better get them checked out really briefly. If that feels like they're fine, they can go home, but but oh, even then, that. and there there have been times, and I, I always warn people, like, when I've had a dog that's had a trauma, and I mean, like, a real trauma, even if they come to me and I'm like, yeah, they sound fine right now. They look okay right now. We did our, curse, like, we did our, like, x-rays. I don't see anything obvious right now. But remember, like, it does take, trauma takes, like, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, sometimes 72 hours, right, to be yeah, added, up to like, three days. Worse. Yeah, yep. because that's inflammation. Inflammation takes three days to get to its like highest level when there's been a problem. This is true of healing in general, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it it really, really sometimes, and it's not that they didn't check thoroughly. It's not, you know, there some things just take a little while to present. And um, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go get them initially checked out so that you have some of those baselines. And yeah, I agree. To watch for. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it's just better be safe than sorry because being sorry usually ends up being really bad for your pet yeah 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 absolutely um and then like i think some of the other things because like have you ever seen any of those videos where, where like dogs are choking on something like you know with like the ball and like you pop the ball out have you ever have you ever done that uh my criticalist and my sorry my resident criticalist actually just did it like a month ago a dog came in with the ball in his throat and just popped it right out it was pretty cool uh, it was yeah. actually, i haven't done it myself but it was like ah, oh, it works so do you recommend like if somebody so I guess how often do you have somebody call saying that their dog's choking? Oh, so you're bringing up a good point here. Um, all the time. And there were owners that come into the clinic being like, yeah, I thought they were choking. So I put my hand down the throat and try to fix it. I'm like, Stop it. <laughs> but, but too, I think it is really important to know is that like their anatomy is the same as ours. If they are choking, they are not going to be eating. They are not going to be able to run around. They're going to like, if they're legitimately choking, you're going to know. Like, it's not a question. Yeah. And I've had too many people call, like, I think my dog's choking for two days. I'm like, no, dog's not nope, he's for not. two days. <laughs> yeah, like, if it's, there's only two tubes that can go in. One of it's in their airway. 
they literally cannot breathe and they will let you know very quickly. Yes. Uh, like this will not be like a couple hour things. It'll be like maybe 30 minutes tops if they can get a little bit of air by it. But like you need to get into the hospital if it's there. They'll show you signs very quickly. If it's in their esophagus, right? usually they're hyper salivating like crazy. They're trying to constantly swallow. They're trying to rush things up. So those are things you're going to see. But like when I'm talking hyper salivating, it's like Niagara Falls coming out of their mouth. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. obsessive. Unless it's really far down, then they just won't eat. I have that. Those, I have one Pomeranian like that where they had an esophageal what, like a farm lower body. esophageal farm body? Yeah, it was right over the crying or the heart, um, essentially in the chest. And oh, wow, yeah. there for a day or so. Uh, and the dog was just not eating. And that was the dog's only symptom. It was really weird. Um, that is weird. Because yeah, a lot like of times thing. you wouldn't necessarily take a chest radiograph. You would no. take it. It's just a, such a small dog. I wonder if you got it in by accident. Yeah, exactly. That's I mean. Uh, well, they we got referred over by another vet. Uh, oh. They were trying to figure out why the dog wasn't eating, and they. So they did a dogogram. Uh, yeah, they, yep. And yeah. I was like, found it. Um, but hey, you know what? There's the advantage of doing the dogogram. Uh, usually I don't like them, but I mean neither. But it helped. But every once in a while, you know what I'll do is like I'll do like my two view abdomen and then be like, okay, for the third view, just just grab up there, <laughs> and then we'll see if we get a hint. We'll do the other two views. <laughs> yep. Just like, just you in know, case I'm not missing anything. Just in case we don't want to miss anything. Exactly. Because sometimes, well, because the thing is too, is like, you know, sometimes depending on what's going on, I mean, you might, you might miss like some air in the esophagus, a mega esophagus, you know, you never know. Yeah. I mean, like sometimes there are other things going on. And so, you know, you never know, but I was just curious. So do you, is there ever a time where you'll tell somebody to go ahead and like swipe in there and see if they can pull something out? Or are you pretty much like a, don't do that. Just bring it here. The amount of times I've seen it actually work for owners is almost never. Because uh, I think they would push it in. That's my worry. They, well, they always like, why grab something? It's like, yeah, you grab their retinoid. Like, that's literally what you grab, like a piece oh. of tissue back there. And yeah. the dog, like, started gagging afterwards. I'm like, yeah, because you grabbed a part of their body that should not be touched. I was like, they're like, yeah, put my hand in there. I'm like, stop doing that. Like, those things are meant to stay. <laughs> yes, like, leave that in there. Um, Like, I think if you really want, if your dog, if you know your dog ate something, like a ball or something like that. If you feel comfortable, you can look online and try and do it at home because it's not rocket science. You right. literally just take your thumbs. You put them on their back. Up. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Put them on the back. You just drag your thumbs up and it pops out their mouth. Um, so that's something they know you hit a ball. Otherwise, bring them in because you reach into their throat. You're going to get bit first. And that's not good for me because I got felt paperwork. And two, you're not going to fix the problem because the dog is just going to gag on your hand and they're not going to let you just put your hand on their throat. So it's right. not. Right, especially if you can't see anything. I mean, then you're going to yes. be in some trouble. The other thing too, though, I would say is also if your dog is like hypersalivating, I, I feel like one thing people miss a lot is, is the stick lodged <laughs> in the teeth. Yep, the stick all the time. That stick is so annoying. <laughs> that, stick is, that stick is there. And, I, you know, I, I've even seen ones that like that stick's been there clearly a long time because like, mm-hmm. and they're yep. you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, they're like, I don't know. I think they have a tooth thing. And you're like, Oh no no that would be a stick. <laughs> yep. <That laughs> Pull that right all out. the time. This gets stuck yeah. right between the dental arcades of their top jaw and uh-huh. the owner's like, yeah, I, I don't know why they make this weird motion with their mouth for like the last two or three days. And you look inside the mouth, it's like right there. You're like, well, and I just send, I usually just send them home at that point. Like your dog's fine, go home. Oh yeah, no, we do the same thing. We're like, here you go, freebie. Bye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just made my life easier. Go. <laughs> yep, no, re- yep, no report for me. And no you reports and be happy. <laughs> It's like when somebody comes in and thinks a nipple is a mass. I'm always like, it's a nipple, go home. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Like, uh, I mean, not to make fun of those type of things, but I had an owner one time come in and dogs, the male anatomy is very similar to some extent to the human male anatomy, uh, except for their bulbarethal gland will look like <laughs> testicles sometimes when they get swollen and they're uh-huh. excited. And that little head and owner be like, my dog has a mass. I was like, he comes in and he's like, oh my God, like the, he's got something wrong with his penis and it's going off on this little tangent. And I realized the dog just had like, it's normal swollen oh, bulbar. Just like really big. <laughs> yep. And I was just like, like, your dog's fine. Please go home. He's like, are you sure? I was like, very. I was like, so sure. <laughs> so sure. Please go home. I so promise uh, you, you just made my day and I just made oh yours. Go ahead. <laughs> That's normal. Right. Exactly. You save money and I get to 
have a good joke afterwards so it's yeah um, yeah but yeah i do actually enjoy we love stuff. those things so you should never feel dumb if that ends up being yeah. you that you just like we would rather hey i would rather give you an anatomy lesson and send you home no problem 100 <laughs> percent. i just want so much easier and I, don't, I love that part of our job like the happy cases because we don't always get those so no no we have yeah. a lot of sad cases and the, and the fact yeah. of the matter is is that we all need those lighthearted things that like turn out happy and it's a funny story after and you yeah. know Sometimes it's very sweet. It's usually somebody like with who's really well intended just loves their animals. Like, what is this thing right here? You're like, oh, that's normal anatomy. Go, yeah, like, <laughs> just go. <laughs> We're yeah, happy. Okay. Yeah, good happy news. But, um, but yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah, else. I think those um, are. The, I think those are the big ones. I mean, I think yeah. we've talked a lot about like medicines that are okay to try at home, situations where it's okay to do it. Um, but I, th I think this is one of those things. I mean, like, you know, your dog can't breathe, get him to the hospital. Your dog goes into cardiac arrest, start CPR, get him to the hospital, seizuring past five minutes, get into the hospital. Like, you know, there's yeah. a lot of those things and, and don't hesitate. I mean, if you think that there's been some real trauma, get him to the hospital. Yeah. Any concern for breathing, don't hesitate. Just bring them oh, to the hospital. Yeah. That's something you don't want to mess around with. And yeah, because dogs will, they'll tire from breathing. And, that's and get, get them to, to Robert's hospital, not mine. I don't have, like... I don't mean that in a mean way, but no, like we do not have the ability to really for a long term, like we don't have an oxygen cage, like we can give them oxygen, but we don't have a cage to keep them in with oxygen. We don't have the ability to do nasal cannulas. We don't have like, we don't, we are not set up like an ER. And there have been a few times where people have called and been like, I really, you know, obviously if they bring them, I can stabilize them hopefully long enough to get them to you. But I hate it. those cases where I'm like, I I need to get them off oxygen long enough to get to you. Whereas if they had just gotten to you first, they could just stay and be okay. Yeah. Um, I actually did have a, an owner that what that actually bought a mobile oxygen thing. Cause they had some, they have so many Frenchies that they were like, just in case we ever need it. I'm not, I am not joking you. They have it. Oh, I know you're not kidding. That's what, I I know that's the fact that they're now the to be fair one. they are the greatest oh, they love their dog so much they just never wanted to be in a situation where they couldn't deliver oxygen I just I just don't know I don't know it's not apparently the number one breed in America so which yay is... Frenchies I love Lord. Frenchies but it does worry I me because here's the thing that means that they're breeding a lot of very unhealthy ones when yeah. whoever and that this is true when golden retrievers were the number one labs i don't care how like common a breed i mean it happened to the it happened to dalmatians it happened to mm. cocker spaniels it happened i mean whenever a dog becomes the most popular it gets totally they get they get like puppy milled and that is not why dogs should be bred like that does not improve the breed it doesn't enhance the breed in any way all it does mm. is give the worst version of that breed all too often and with a frenchie that is a very scary proposition because they already have a lot of problems, even in the best of situations. And I love Frenchies. I am not saying anything negative about Frenchies or Ricky Zubelix because I love them, but, but it is a reality. And I will be happy to say negative things about Frenchies because I love them as a breed, but they should not exist. They're just. Well, they, they like don't, they shouldn't exist in nature. I mean, like, they, they can't even breed. <laughs> exactly. I was like, they just physically, yeah. they're, they're at a, they're starting off in the negatives when they or they're born, so they're hard, they're hard hard time catching up. So yeah, it's they're true. very cute. They're very they cute. Are very cute, and they have great personalities. The ones that try not to bite me, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, the ones that are Frenchy like have great personalities. Some of them are nasty little buggers. I know, but, yeah, but that, I, they shouldn't be like that. That's not like that's like saying like that. Like I'm mean, I've had golden retrievers that try to bite me, but that's that's not the, how they normally are as a breed. Frenchies are not normally like that. They are supposed to be like sweet little funny companions. They're supposed to be. I think over the last decade, I've seen them get like more aggressive. Like they're like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because so they've been poorly bred. Yeah. Totally they've been agreed. so aggressive. It's funny. Um, yeah. But I digress. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. We went off on a bit of a tangent there. So anyway, if you have any questions, make sure to email us at podcast at mybalto.com. We're happy to explore any uh, topics that you may have any questions about. And uh, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, if you enjoyed our podcast, don't forget to give us five stars because we love to have your review. Because I always forget to say that. <laughs> that's right. I can do the one thing. So you, you do that. I can do this. It'd be great. You can trade off a little bit. So Go back and forth. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's cool. So uh, yeah, give us a five-star review because we'd love to hear from you and know what we can do better. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again for listening. This has been the Pause It Podcast. We will see you guys. Yeah.